Have you been injured in a motor vehicle accident? With over 40 years of experience in personal injury litigation, James Maliti and his team at Lawyers West LLP, well, they've seen it all. Check them out now at www.lawyerswest.ca to set up your free consultation. Green men are live here in Vancouver. Ashley Young delivers. Episode two of the Rise. My name is Ryan Sullivan. I'm joined, as always, by the one and only Mr. J. Demerit D. Six Merit. If you're on that social media thing, we have an amazing guest lined up for today's show. Colin O'Brady is joining us. His story is absolutely incredible. Uh, we'll dive into it in just a moment. But but keeping this trend going of inspiring stories, we had Kai Kamara on last week. Uh, and now we go to call. I mean, obviously, we're switching up the sport a little bit here, but that's what it's all about. The show is meant to inspire, and I think we're going to go two for two here. And Colin, uh, you know, again, this guy is he's climbed to the top of the seven highest peaks in the world and yeah. set world records, the fastest to do a lot of these uh, extreme feats. So, you know, I love, you know, we talk about mindset a lot on the show, what it takes to get there, climb the metaphorical mountains of our lives. And I mean, <laughs> the guy does it physically in, in, in real life. So, you know, we can't wait to get a guy like that. On, on this type of show because that takes an incredible amount of mindset and also physical physical attributes to, to make those things happen. So these yeah. are the types of people we want on this show. It's, it's incredible. It's an amazing story. We're going to dive into it in uh, just one quick moment uh, because the, the big thing, I mean, you see a lot of things. Oh, yeah, this guy he climbed Everest. Oh, yeah, he did Kilimanjaro, something like that. But there is something more to this story. Um, that really will in, inspire something in you. I mean, the, the stuff that he's had to overcome, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's going to make your head spin. But before we get to the interview with Colin, we got to pay the bills. It's time for the Berard Block. But first, actually, we'll thank, uh, of course, Lawyers West, presenting sponsor right off the top, James Maliti. Not a good man. He's a great man. Great man. Fantastic. We appreciate their support as always. But let's talk a little Berard physio. The lower back pain, it's starting to set in. It's getting chillier by the day. Uh, they got manual therapy, IMS, laser, exercise prescription. Whether you're injured your back 10 years ago or you did it 10 minutes ago, does not matter. These guys are there for you. With over 150 years of combined experience, you know you're in the right hands with the good folks at Berard Physiotherapy. And we get to the next Berard, the good folks at Berard Roofing. And now this. Drip, drip, drip. Ladies, you don't have to sleep with that drip tonight. You know, that annoying drip in your home you just haven't gotten around to getting rid of? Berard Roofing and Drainage can fix that annoying drip. For 40 years, Berard Roofing and Drainage has been fixing roof leaks right down to the cause, guaranteed. Call Berard Roofing and Drainage. Call 604-986-1812. Berard Roofing and Drainage. We've got you covered. And next up, we have the Berard Hotel. They came on there new to the rise. I guess everyone's new to the rise because it's a new show. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we do thank them for their support. And they did something that not many could do. And that's bringing the green men out of retirement. Wow. Even two guys in green spandex sometimes need to break away from regular life. And the Berard has everything we need. Space for hanging out. Likes for exploring. Sweet rooms for getting ready for the game. And an amazing downtown location. So, so book, book your Berard breakaway break now and we'll see you at the game. Uh, we're stoked to be working with the Berard Hotel. If you check out the bottom of the screen here, we've got a promo code there for you. Uh, it's going to get you 15% off your next booking. It's it's the, the staycation destination. If you're staying in town, you want to come in from Surrey, you want to come in from Coquitlam or Pitt Meadows, wherever, you want to have a couple bevvies and go to the game, this is the way to do it. It's such an amazing setup they got going on over there. Uh, and there's a contest kicking in as well. You want to check out the Green Men Facebook page for more information on that. And, of course, we thank the good folks over at Red Truck Brewery. They just opened up a new one over in Colorado. Can you so. see the... Multitude of 12 packs behind us. Yeah. You can in that shot right there. Can in that one. You can in that one as well. 
Yeah. Look at those. The multi-pack field trip Northwest IPA, round trip Amber Ale, road trip Because it was a long lager. weekend. So. <laughs> well, we made it a well, long weekend. Thanksgiving in Not Canada on the next weekend, so probably yeah. need a refill I think by we Thursday. Might. I think we might have to. All right. <laughs> I think it's time. Shall we dive in? We shall. Let's go. All right. We welcome in our guest for episode number two, Mr. Colin O'Brady. <laughs> Buddy, this is an absolute thrill. Uh, what you've been able to do um it's just been nothing short of incredible and we're absolutely stoked to have you uh so welcome to the show and uh wh- wh- why don't we why don't we start uh from scratch that's that's probably the best way to do it but a nice chronological way to tell the story uh you're a washington man but you were raised in portland uh what's it like growing up in uh beautiful portland oregon yeah, it's a good place. You know, I grew up, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. You guys are up there in Vancouver. So I think of that as kind of like the extended Pacific Northwest, you know, it's kind of similar. Um, but, you know, beautiful, beautiful part of the country. You know, you know, I was grateful to have parents that really were about getting me outside and outdoors and, you know, didn't grow up with a ton of money, but the access to being in the mountains or the ocean, the beach and whatnot, um, you know, made it a really great place to grow up. So I'm grateful to call this home for sure. Some amazing stuff that you've done, and what makes it so incredible uh, is an incident that took place while you were traveling. Uh, do you want to go uh, back? Yeah, so uh, you know, I had growing up, you know, growing up in Portland, I was a swimmer and soccer player, um, and I was uh, recruited to play collegiate soccer Division One as well as swim Division One. Um, and uh, I took the I took the opposite route as uh, as Jay did, so I, I went into swimming in college instead of playing soccer. This is one thing yeah. I'd love to have the have, have kids understand um, when you're making that choice because I had some choices too. I had a basketball uh, or a soccer, and, and obviously when you come out of uh, out of you know your your adolescence as a, as a multi sport athlete, um, what made you choose? You know, I get that ask I question that all the time. Well, what made you choose? soccer over basketball or in your case swimming over soccer you know what i mean i think i think that's always yeah. important for, for for our listeners to understand like what makes those choices happen yeah you know you know I, I, you can understand this as a multi-sport athlete as a kid like it's tough to make that choice you know um you probably enjoyed both and i enjoyed both immensely and i was you know amazing to be you know recruited at the top collegiate level for both sports is, is certainly a you know a great a testament to that but um you know, ultimately, I chose swimming, um, I think mostly because actually, for me, it was going to give me an opportunity to leave the West Coast um, and go to school. So the, the recruitment for soccer was a little more regional for me. So it was great schools, but mostly in the Pac-10 Pac at the time, Pac-12. So, you know, or, you know, Oregon, Stanford, UCLA, you know, the West Coast, basically, um, versus swimming uh, allowed me to go to the East Coast. And I'm glad that I did that, although I'm more of a West Coast guy at my heart. I think it was good for me to get a little taste of a different part of the U.S., a different living in a different part of the country. Um, but it wasn't an easy choice. And quite honestly, you know, kids younger and younger are specializing in kind of sport, force and force to specialize in sports. And I'm glad that I didn't have so much pressure, but I certainly had coaches 12, 13 years old. You know, my soccer coach telling me to quit swimming and my swim coach telling me to quit soccer. Um, but it was great to be able to play both. And honestly, it wasn't easy. I missed it, man. Like I missed having that team environment when swimming is such an individual sport. But there was something about – um, the purity of swimming and that kind of individual pursuit to cut time and all that kind of stuff that really excited me. And, and ultimately, if you kind of look at where I've gone, it's kind of continued down that individual sports path. So it served me well anyway. All right. So let's uh, let's 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 get into this. We we you you got a trip going to Thailand and uh, we will let you take it from there. Yeah, no, it's a good segue. So after graduating from college, you know, finishing up swimming, um, you know, in last year, the next Michael Phelps and swimming, you know, there's not really, there's not like a professional swimming league or something like that to go to that next level. Um, and there's only, you know, two guys per event making the Olympics. So it's, you know, pretty hard once you're done with that. So I kind of thought sports was behind me, even though I was 21 years old and swimming well. Um, and all my friends actually were running to go to wall street. This was 2006 when I graduated from college. So kind of pre credit crisis, pre, you know, downfall of wall street, uh, in 2008. Um, but I was like, you know, I want to do something. I want to travel. I grew. I didn't grow up with a lot of money as a kid. I didn't really get to do any international travel, but always dreamed of having some adventures like that. Um, and I had actually every summer since I was 16 painted houses in the summer. And every summer I would save up about a thousand bucks and put it in this kind of, you know, to the side and go one day I'm going to travel the world. And so I took what felt like a lot of money to me at the time, but it was probably like $7,000, you know, saved up over the course of six years or something like that. And was like, I'm going to go see the world. And so I took a backpack and a surfboard, um, and kind of one way ticket to, to see the world. And that's, you know, wasn't, wasn't glamorous. I was hitchhiking around, I was staying in youth hostels, but I was, 
you know, I surfed in Fiji and Australia and I hitchhiked around New Zealand and it was, you know, a great adventure to see, see and meet people. And I ended up in rural Thailand uh, on a beach in 2008. So just over 10 years ago. And unfortunately that's kind of where my story goes, uh, dramatically South and negative. Um, I, uh, ended up being severely burned in a fire. So there was a flaming rope, a, a flaming jump rope actually that ended up wrapping around my legs and splattering my body to my neck um, with kerosene. And my entire body was lit on fire. I had to jump in the ocean to extinguish the flames, which um, saved my life, but not before 25% of my body, predominantly my legs and feet were severely burned. And you know, the scariest part of this, other than the fact that I was in a place with no ambulance you know i had a, a moped ride down a dirt path you know there was no hospital there was like a one-room nursing station um i underwent eight surgeries there with a cat running around my bed in the icu you know kind of like you know, you're in the middle of nowhere not place you want to be going under um surgery but i had no choice and the doctors were saying to me you know you'll probably never walk again normally um and so that was really the scariest part of all and just kind of the not just the physical setback in the immediacy but actually having doctors look you in the eye and say like look like You've been an athlete your whole life. You've been active. Like your life's going to be dramatically different. You won't be able to walk again normally. Um, and that's where it was kind of hit my all time low, maybe in my entire life was that moment. Little did they know, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, yeah. It, it, now let's talk about the comeback. Okay, so now now this now this happens. Um, anyone uh, that, that that listens in that's had a serious injury before. Um, understands that there's a whole recovery process to this. It doesn't just happen yeah. in a day. Uh, there's a lot of mental and physical battles that you go through, um, you know, again, as being a, a, a healthy, active individual beforehand to not be able to do that. Um, I always ask about what people think about when they're lying in bed injured and they can't do anything else. And like, let's start with that. What, what were you thinking about yeah. to get through it? And then what was your process like to get back to the, to the ability to say even, you know, run a marathon, let alone, you know, climb the seven tallest summits in the world? You know yeah. what I mean? Like that, you that, know. that kind of process we'll get to, but let's start with when you're injured and when it sucks, what do you think about? Yeah, no, I mean, it, like I said, it was a huge low point for me. Um, and you know, my recovery, I think originally is a testament to you know, one specific individual who is my mother, uh, an incredible woman. Uh, she hopped on a plane, uh, and flew all the way over to Thailand and ended up about day four or day five of this ordeal. Um, arriving at my bedside and you mentioned you're a parent I'm not I'm not a parent but I, I imagine I will be at some point hopefully um, but the I can only imagine what it's like to be a mother of parents see their kid in that way and then you know middle of nowhere in Thailand can't really communicate with the doctors she's afraid um, but what's incredible to me about the story is looking back you know she did not show me her fear like she didn't come in crying and being all upset or like oh my god your life's over she actually came into my hospital room every day with this big smile on her face. And I was like, what are you smiling about, mom? My life's over. I'm never going to walk again normally. What's going on? She was like, let's think about what you want to do when you get out of here. You have, you're 21 years old. Like, you have a whole life in front of you. Like, let's set a goal. Let's look towards the future. And my initial thought was that ne that negative space, which was like, what, you know, like, mom, no, like, it's over. Like, stop, mm -hmm. like, trying to cheer me up, like, whatever. But she kind of just kept at me day in and day out. And I know now that when she wasn't in my hospital room, she was in the hallways crying. She was pleading with the doctors for good news. She wasn't a wholly you know, positive, but she was this kind of positive beacon in my mind in life. And I finally turned to her one day and I said, all right, I'll play your game. You know, one day I'm going to race a triathlon, which is not something I had ever done before. Obviously, I've been a collegiate swimmer, but never biked or run competitively. And she was like, instead of being like, yeah, I set a goal, but maybe something. <laughs> yeah, realistic. maybe go for like, a run. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, she was, and she was like, no, okay, great. That's your goal. And so immediately I actually told the doctors, Hey, I'm training for a triathlon right now. And they looked at me like I was crazy, but I was like, bring some weights. And so I actually had this photo of myself in the Thai hospital lifting weights, but my waist is bandaged from the waist down. The doctor's looking at me like I'm absolutely crazy. But it was in that moment that I just had this tangible goal that I was working on. So fast forward, you know, a few more months, I was finally released from the Thai hospital. I was carried on and off the plane, placed in a wheelchair when I got home to Portland, Oregon. And my mother that day in our kitchen table, she said, okay, now your goal, I know is to race a triathlon, but today you got to figure out how to take your first step. And so she grabbed a chair from our kitchen table and placed it one step in front of my wheelchair and said, you got to figure out how to get out of your wheelchair and take that first step. And, you know, I, I remember that day, it took me, you know, three hours or something to get out of the wheelchair and get into the chair, but I took the first step. And then the next day she moved the chair five steps away. And the next day she moved the chair 10 steps away, which really I think is, you know, maybe it's trite, but it's a metaphor for like, you know, this recovery process literally started for me with a single step, one step at a time, getting out of that wheelchair. 
And then fast forward 18 months, I really was committed to this goal. So I finally did take a job in Chicago um, as a commodities trader, as I imagine, because I, as I mentioned, as I didn't want to live in my parents' basement forever as an invalid. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, you know, I said, I honored that goal. I said, I'm joining a gym. I'm going to learn about what triathlons are. I knew nothing about them. I would like ask random guys at the gym, like, how do you like put on the shoes on the bike after your feet are wet? And like, how do you like, literally, like, I knew none of these things. Um, but I showed up and raced the Chicago triathlon just 18 months after my burn accident and crossing that finish line for me, I had kind of honored this goal and showed that I could be whole again. But what was completely an utter surprise for me is I hadn't just finished the race, but I actually had won the entire Chicago triathlon placing first out of about four or 5,000 other participants <laughs> on the day, which, you know, was a, a crazy comeback. And, you know, it, it's kind of a fun story to tell it, the achievement of it. But what the most important lesson for me is because it's kind of where you were saying about the mindset or kind of what the pathway was, was instead of taking that and being like, wow, I did this crazy thing. I was almost like, whoa, like this was like such a profound moment for me that I thought back. I was like, what would have happened had my mom not forced me to look towards the future and set this measurable goal. Like my life would be completely different. I would have been depressed. I might not be able to walk again. I wouldn't have done the rehab the same. I wouldn't have had that mindset. And it was scary to imagine sort of that alternate negative universe that could have easily happened. Um, but then I took it a step further and I said, this, I'm not some superhuman, like athletic freak. I'm not like, you know, I'm, I'm just a uh, guy. So I think this applies to all people. And I started to realize like as humans, not just me, but as humans, I believe we all have reservoirs of untapped potential inside of us and can achieve incredible things in our lives. And so I wanted to make the next steps in my life, not only about continuing to push my own goals, step outside my comfort zone, but also to use that as a role model or beacon for others to do the same in their own lives by overcoming obstacles and achieving their you know, greatest potential. That's absolutely incredible. Just crazy story, man. Bang um, on with the rise and shine message yeah, as well. Boom. You know, <laughs> we'll end the show right there. I no, love it. <laughs> um, but uh, but let's let's go back to the the start of that triathlon. Um, what's going through your mind uh, right before you get rolling past that finish line? Right before, or sorry, the the start line. Right before you get going, um, is it is it a mental? Um, is was there any like you know mental obstacles there? Uh, the the physical side of it was there pain throughout? How did that go? You know, it was an interesting day. It was funny. Like I said, I was such a novice to triathlons in general. I really didn't know what to expect other than what I could glean from random people I'd like ask questions about. Um, and then triathlons, a funny thing. I'm not sure how familiar you guys or if you've done them before, but um, in a big triathlon like that, uh, there's, you know, 5,000 participants or whatever. You're split up into waves that are starting every five minutes from each other, like based on your age group or gender or whatever. And so over the course of five, you know 50 waves of five minutes apart, people are starting three hours after each other or beginning, you know, the race is basically very spread out. And so when I dove in, I was the 39th wave of the day out of 52 or something like that. And so as I was racing, I was pushing my hardest um, and knew that no one had come past me, but I had no idea even when I crossed the finish line that I had won the race. I crossed the finish line. My grandmother was there because she lived in Chicago. She was like, I'm so proud of you. You overcame you know, your, your injury. She gives me a big hug. And I was like, yeah, wow, I'm really happy. I'm tired. Let's go get a drink of water. Let's go get my bike. And so we walk over to where my bike is, collect my bike and wetsuit. She takes me out to lunch. And we just have a chat about all sorts of just, you know, whatever, just a normal day with my grandma. She's like, I'm proud of you. Let's go to the finish line and see what place you came in your age group. And so we walked back to the finish line, literally just going like, oh, what place I came with this. And the guy like is like, wait, we've been calling your name over the loudspeaker. This is yours. And I was like, what? And he hands me first place overall plaque. He's like, yeah, you won the whole race. <laughs> oh, so like, it's, it's one of those moments where, you know, I look at my athletic career and, you know, you, as you guys are obviously both athletes as well as sometimes the, the heat of the moment or a big championship match or game or race or whatever can be very exciting. But in this case, I was super focused on process. Like I was just like me doing my best on that day, not really caring about my surrounds, not even honestly quite aware of that because I didn't really know how the sport worked perfectly well. And as I crossed the finish line, it wasn't like, and I won, yes. And there was a guy chasing right behind me. I was just like, oh, I did it, great. Like personal <laughs> satisfaction. I think it's actually, it, to me, you know, it's a testament to, the process like that moment those two hours that i did that race was actually just more um an extension of the 18 months of recovery so i was mostly thinking about 
well, I've gotten over this and those first steps, my mother's guidance and joining the gym and all of the things and just kind of having that be the sort of celebration of the end of, of this process and a new chapter in my life, which it, it ended up being because I did the most obvious thing, of course, which is I went, the race was on a Sunday and I went in on Monday morning and quit my job as a commodities trader and became a professional triathlete because I got a sponsor, which by the way, is not like playing in the MLS or the NBA. It's like, here's a couple plane tickets so you can like <laughs> sleep on this guy's couch. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was, it was enough for me to jump ship and ended up racing for the U S national team in you know, 25 countries, six different continents all over the world uh, as a professional triathlete, which was a, a great chapter of next chapter of my life. Okay. So I have uh so I have one triathlon story, and it's the worst thing in the world. I just like <laughs> the only thing I've ever done. Uh, it was a, it, like the sprint, you know. So it's like uh, it's like a triathlon light, pretty much. It's you know you do yeah. like you swim, whatever it is. Uh, there, well, this is how we did. So we were in the green suits, and this is why it was the worst <laughs> thing ever. Um, so <laughs> they they paired us up. It was like the Subaru International Vancouver Tri, and it was just a sprint, so it was a shortened version of it. And uh, they paired us up with like the world's best Canadian swimmer, and this girl was insane. Like she was she was like a fish. She went in, she just like she hit the uh, you know the halfway point, was right back on the beach while people were still swimming out. And so she gave me this huge lead. I didn't know I had to bike. It's like 20k or something. I was like, oh, it's a sprint, so I probably got to go like 2k. I could pull that off. So I'm in this green suit on this bike, and I, it looks ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and then my, my chain fell off, and I haven't ridden a bike at this point probably in like 15 years, and I'm in a green suit. I can't actually see what I'm doing because the green suit, you can see like a hand right here. So I'm like going like this with my chain on the side of the road. Oh, um, yeah, we ended up losing considerably. <laughs> it was, really? it thanks, was, thanks to Sully. It was pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, you blew you blew the lead. Yeah, that that green suit went right in the garbage. It was uh, it was pretty bad, but, but it was uh, all for a good cause. All for a great cause, absolutely. <laughs> so why why don't we go from uh, the triathlon uh, to the the seven summits? So uh, you know you go from an amazing feat and then you take it up a notch. I mean, what was the inspiration and and what kept you going? Yeah, so like I mentioned, I had raced triathlon professionally for about six years. Um, amazing chapter in my life. Um, and I really had a pathway to continue to race triathlon for many more years. The peak age of triathlon, actually, particularly for Ironman distances, you know, mid thirties, I was 29 at the time. Um, and I kind of just, just sat with, uh, uh Jenna, uh, my, my wife, um, and we actually recently been engaged and we we're just kind of thinking about the next chapter of our life and what's important to us and our values. And we were like, this has been an amazing chapter. And I, I still wanted to push myself as an athlete, but we also felt like I wonder if there's a larger platform that we can build from doing something. And so we kind of just had this brainstorm and I always dreamed of climbing Everest or the seven summits or something like that. And we we're like, wait a second, what if I set this crazy audacious goal, um, which is to set the world record for something called the Explorer's Grand Slam. So that's to climb the tallest mountain on each of the seven continents, um, you know, Everest, Denali, Kilimanjaro, et cetera, as well as complete expeditions to both the North Pole and South Pole in world record time. So fewer than 50 people in history at the time had ever completed the Grand Slam. Most of those people doing so in five years, 10 years, whatever, doing an expedition, coming home, resting, recovering, planning the next one. And the goal for us was to see if I could do them all consecutively. So not taking any breaks in between, um, and doing, you know, climbing a mountain, flying to the next one. But the larger purpose was, we're like, if we can do this, as I mentioned before, to exemplify for people the process of setting an ambitious goal and a achieving it um, and what that might mean for other people, particularly around health and wellness and kids. And so we founded a nonprofit that was focused on inspiring kids to set goals, dream big and live active and healthy lives um, that we called Beyond 7-2. And our idea really was to say, hey, we can build a big media campaign around this world record, but kind of funnel the exposure around that towards fundraising for this cause that we are really important to, as well as creating a ton of awareness for that. Now, the the funny backstory, very sh short backstory of this is we had no experience in any of this. Like we'd never started a nonprofit. We needed like, you know, half a million dollars to climb these mountains. I was not a professional mountaineer. We didn't have a big, you know, Instagram follow. You wouldn't have any of the things. We were like, yeah, this is like a great idea. Um, and so sometimes people know that we pulled this whole thing off, which we can talk about. But the truth is there was about a two year process that like this went from being a whiteboard inside of our, you know, one bedroom apartment to like an idea scrawled out on the back of a napkin to taking our first meeting to, the first 200 brands we talked to saying no, 
um, to us knowing nothing about media and PR to finally, after a very long process of failure, reinvention, trying again, trying new things, getting a little bit lucky, getting unlucky, all the process like any entrepreneur or founder might go through to, yes, we did barely raise the money. We did set the world record in 139 days and ultimately had 500 million earned media impressions, but it's all, um, and I know a lot of your guys is messaging around what the work you do is, is, is that rise and shine. It's like that daily work, that daily grind. Like this didn't just like, we didn't just have an idea and it just like hit us over the head. Like Jenna and I sacrificed for several years and the amount of people that we love who are key people in our life, who have mentored us, who looked at us and go, uh, maybe like dream a little smaller or like maybe climb a few other mountains before you try Everest or maybe, you know, all of the reasons why this might not work. And we were just like, no, we've got this big vision. We want to do it. We were like, you know, laser sharp committed to it. And yeah, the reason I tell that story is that it, it's, um, you know, any, any founder, a lot of success. It's nice to talk about that success. It's nice to watch Usain Bolt break a world record at the Olympic games and run 9.5 in the hundred, whatever it is, you know, whatever that is. Um, but I know a little bit of your, your backstory, Jay, and this is that like, it's a work in progress There's a lot of days where like, it's, it's great when someone's giving you a hug, you set a world record, you won this championship or this. And you're like, yeah, but let me tell you about like the 10 years before oh, that, yeah. where I was like grinding and like no one gave a scared about me at all. And like, you know, all that kind of stuff. So this is, this is a little bit of that story as well, which is that there was a long and hard road and really Jenna and I in a room alone, you know with our laptops, like trying to figure out solutions to this. Um, and in the end, it, it is a great achievement, but uh, it was a lot of work and, you know, the, the journey was uh, full of ups and downs. Well, yeah, you know, and again, I, that was kind of literally what my whole TED talk was based on. It was called, are you ready for your sunny day? So you have all these dark days and normally the mindset of, 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 uh, of the human is opposite. It's, are we ready for when, when the rain comes or are we ready? Are we insured in case shit goes wrong? You know, instead of uh, are we, are we, do we believe in the system and the process enough for when that sunny day comes that we're ready to knock it out of the park? And that was always mindset. Yeah. It wasn't the opposite. So, you know, again, I really appreciate that um, from, from your side. It sounds, sounds extremely similar. Um, okay. So now, you know, again, now let's talk about now, you know, and, and, you know, you break world record, world records. And now again, the part of, you know, just like any professional, it's, 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 it's one thing to get there, but it's another thing to stay there. And so now how do you, how do you keep yourself motivated? Uh, again, you were just talking, talking to us about um, uh, the challenge you just, uh, you just totally knocked out of the park again this summer, 50 states uh, to the tallest uh, peak in every one of those states in 21 days. Uh, can you talk to us about what you're doing now? And then, and then what, is the, what does the next couple of years hold for you? And, and, and how are you going to yeah. keep rising and shining? Yeah, so we... Um you know, originally called both our nonprofit and that uh, Explorers Grand Slam project that I mentioned, um, Beyond 7-2. Um, and the, the seven is significant of the seven summits and the two being significant of the North and South Pole, the two poles. And, <clears throat> you know, in that project, we, we were hoping that it was going to have a longer duration to it and that we'd be able to do more beyond it. That's why we named it Beyond 7-2. It's not just this one goal, but it's this bigger thing. It's this campaign around kids' health. It's, um, it, it's, it's about multiple other projects and, and things we can do. Um, and it's been amazing to have it grow into that after I, you know, successfully climbed Everest and came down and summited Denali and set two world records in that moment on that project. Of course, we got that inevitable question, which is what's next? Um, and it's funny how quickly people ask you that question. You know, I probably got that question on the, the next day. It was, you know, May 27th, 2016. I, you know, had CBS Sunday morning at my house, like interviewing. So what's next? And I'm like, I just poured, you know, how much of my life <laughs> like achieving this thing? Um, give me a second to breathe. But, you know, we built it with the idea to be able to continue to do it. So, you know, one thing that we focused on in 2017 was the continuation of our impact work. So continuing our work within public schools, inspiring kids. I went all across the country speaking to kids in person, you know, thousands of kids in person, as well as digitally with these things I do called virtual field trips of sort of sharing this story, but in a way that, you know, it's through their lens. So one of the questions I love to ask kids is, I told you a story about climbing Everest and they love to hear that I was the first person to Snapchat from the summit of Mount Everest because that's super cool to kids, you know, stuff like that. But really I'm like, but what's your Everest? Like, what is your Everest? What are the goals you're dreaming for? And kind of putting it into this kind of metaphor and then kids come back with incredible things. You know, you know, my Everest is to be the first person in my family to graduate from college. Let's talk about how to get there. My Everest is, you know, whatever those big aspirational goals are. So it's given me a platform to continue to do that. Um, 
And so, you know, where I'm at now and where I'm headed is, um, you know, that was 2016, the Explorers Grand Slam project. And then this summer, um, as you mentioned, I, I did set another world record, which was to climb the tallest mountain in each of the 50 U.S. states. Um, and I did that in 21 days. The previous record had been 41. But what was fun about that project is we had a large call to action because I went around with talked to school kids about climbing Everest, about climbing the tallest mountains in the world. And of course, most kids are like, that's incredible. But some are from, you know, low income communities or from, you know, whatever different circumstance. They're like, what does that mean? I have to like try to go to the North Pole to do something epic. And I'm like, absolutely not. You can do this right here in your own backyard. It's about getting healthier. It's about moving your body. It's about setting goals, you know, where you're at in your life. And that can progress to even bigger things. And so with the 50 High Points project was really cool because I said, um, you guys have probably seen the movie Forrest Gump, I would imagine, um, at some point. Um, and I, uh, I, I called my kind of in a, my project uh, had something called the Forrest Gump effect, which is, which was to invite anyone to come out, kids, their families, communities, to climb any of the 50 high point mountains with them. So it was this way of saying, yes, I've set world records around the world, but you know what I'm also doing? I'm doing something in everyone's backyard. I'm going to all 50 states and come meet me at the trailhead, come hike a mile or two with me, meet me on the summit, like be a part of this. And we had thousands of people come out and actually participate in real time. And that doesn't just have the spillover effect of them being a part of one little thing I'm doing. But then the follow up from that has been because I got out there and climbed to the tallest point in Missouri with you. Now I'm thinking about running my first 5k or I'm, I'm dreaming about this goal in my life or that goal in my life. And so it was a fun way to really bring some of my initiatives and missions really to people's uh, to people's doorsteps. So that was that was really fun. And so the continuation of my work is kind of twofold, which is, you know, I believe in the power of unlocking human potential. Um, that's really one of the things that I stand for, one of my core values. Um, and, and that manifests in two ways. One is now having this platform to inspire others to do that in their own life. That's what excites me the most. But also, you know, I'm 33 years old. I'm a, you know, still near the peak of my athletic endurance and, and there's goals that I want to accomplish. And so, you know, I've set some other large, very large audacious goals. Um, I, uh, and actually in about a few weeks, I leave um, for the most ambitious project of my entire life. Um, I haven't announced it publicly yet, so I'm going to hold off on that. But um, it's going to be a very exciting adventure um, in, in a very remote part of the world um, to do something that no one in history has ever accomplished. Um, and I'll be doing that over the course of the next few months. And again, when I do these campaigns, it's very tied to not just, hey, look at me, I'm Colin, I'm trying to set a world record. It's actually the opposite of that. Like, I hope that my story fades into the background, but is actually just a platform or a catalyst for other people to go, wow, he's doing that in his life. I want to do that. And that's not always through sports. That could be entrepreneurship, business, love, music, art, like whatever it is you're passionate about, but having the sort of um, desire and inspiration to go out, you know, grab life by the horns and, and, and chase those dreams in a meaningful way is, is really what I hope to inspire in the world. It's in incredible, man. Um, such a story. And it, it does kind of pain me that you're 33 because I haven't done half of <laughs> <laughs> half of half you of the get things on the move, that you've done. I know. <laughs> like we were saying, I don't even like walking up the Let's stairs. Get that green suit out of the closet and get that thing on the top of Everest. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I don't know if that's the answer. I don't know. I've got to go sans green suit from here, I think. But oh. uh, but I got but, but I want to ask, uh, and we asked this to uh, Kai on last week's show, um, you know, what's what's the 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 final message we called it the keep on truck in question but we're going to come up with a new name for that well now but um, but, but we're going to you know it's actually going to be the rise and shine rule so there it is what are the um what are your rise and shine so the, this is literally as, as general as what are what are three things that you live your life by every day um that if you were to say okay if you do this every day you will find success in your own life so one of my personal mantras is uh this too shall pass and it, it's a great reminder of sort of the impermanence of whatever situation we find ourselves in. Uh, I find it personally to be the most valuable, of course, during hard times. And unfortunately, I don't like to be a Debbie Downer, but you know, no matter who you are, you know, we face setbacks in life. You know, we face obstacles. Um, you know, for me, this was a severe burn accident, um, but everyone has different versions of that uh, in their own lives. And in those moments, it's very hard to feel like life's life's over. It's not gonna nothing's gonna be the same. Or when when you're climbing that proverbial mountain, you're tired, you're exhausted. And when I tell myself this too shall pass, it's a powerful mantra for me to remind, like, oh, like if I keep moving forwards through this, this too shall pass. Like this this hard time will pass. But it's also valuable to remember that in the high highs, as, as someone like yourself who's had a lot of success, you know this that 
that that moment also passes too. Like you're the champion, you're the world <laughs> yeah. record holder, you're this and like, but it's also important not to not celebrate the moment. Heck yeah, you've earned it. Celebrate that moment. But like this too shall pass too. So what are the next things that I want to continue to do? Because it's not like I want to just have some achievement when I was 29 years old and go, well, that's what I did with my life. In the last 70 years, I just talked about doing the one thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what are the next things? And so I guess that brings me to the, the second, you know, rise and shine goal, if you want to, or rise and shine, uh, if you want to call it that, is, um, you know, for me, it's all about the incremental process. Um, it's an incremental uh, process of setting and achieving goals. So I really believe in setting that big audacious goal, but exemplified by my mother putting the chair one step in front of my wheelchair and kind of forgetting about the triathlon. Um, or the other way I like to talk about it in the, the climbing context is I have a, a rock that I carry in my pocket and it's a small rock from the summit of Mount Everest. And I carry that with me most days as a reminder that even Mount Everest, the largest mountain in the world, can be broken down to its smallest parts, a bunch of small rocks stacked on top of each other, many steps leading to the summit. And so what I live my, live my life by is dream big, set audacious goal, go crazy, let your, let your imagination run wild. But then ask yourself the question like, what's the one rock that I can stack today? What's the one step I can take towards that goal? Because all of a sudden, this crazy huge goal that seems impossible. Jen and I set this ridiculous goal sitting in our apartment and then we go to Google, like, oh, we want to do a media campaign. Google, how do you do good media? And PR? I mean, we asked like the most basic dumb question to Google, but that was like, that was our first step. That day now, four years later, we've learned a ton and know how to do these things or whatever. But don't be afraid to set the big goal, not knowing what the whole path looks like. You know what the one step is. Go to the library and check out the one book that you're going to learn one thing from. That's going to teach you what step two is or step three or step four. So those would be the two things that come to mind. This too shall pass and the empower of taking those incremental steps towards the larger audacious goal. I wrote down, trust the process, but dream big. Yes, I like it. That, that's concise. I, I, like I, that. I ramble on All sometimes. Right. I apologize. Oh, I, I, I live in your world, dude. Uh, <laughs> amazing. Uh, well, Colin, thanks so much. Uh, I know obviously you're a busy guy, and uh, uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to inspire our listeners and to uh, to share your story. You know that that's what this is truly is all about is to make make sure we're we're staying on the human side of life and, and making sure that people like yourself are inspiring and doing the work that you do goes to goes to to all the people believing in in, in, in the way they should. And where can people find you? They like I want to know what the next initiative is here. Yeah, well, once we turn the cameras off, I'm going to tell you guys what it is. <laughs> okay. Air, but, um, no, um, the, uh, the way you can follow along, my Instagram, at Colin O'Brady, that's just my name, C-O-L-I-N-O-B-R-A-D-Y. That's where I'm kind of sharing live content, and certainly from this upcoming adventure, that's where will be kind of the main hub. But, of course, my website, colinobrady.com, um, has all the information. It's got my TED Talk that has more than a million views and, you know, all the public speaking and various different things I do, also the information about my nonprofit. So, those are the two places, colinobrady.com, my website, or my Instagram, at Colin O'Brady. Um, and lo love people following along, reaching out. Uh, love responding to people who reach out about their goals and their dreams. So, uh, you know, go reach out, say hello. I appreciate it. So good, man. I, I echo everything that uh, Jay just said. Thank you so much for, uh, for spreading the word, for inspiring optimism, man. Uh, a tremendous interview, and we love the story, and uh, wish you all the best, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks a lot. it. Talk to you soon, bud. Yeah. I'm going to bleep this and post. But holy sh**, what an amazing, amazing individual to go from third degree burns on a quarter of his body to a triathlon in 18 months. And I mean, that to me stood out. That for me like is the crazy. craziest one. Yeah. 18 no, months. No, not just a triathlon in 18 months. He won the thing yeah, let's in 18 months after never doing a triathlon before. And he wins that's the thing with thousands of participants. That's nuts, dude. That's I felt, crazy. I felt like an idiot throwing the Green Men story in there. Uh, with the triathlon sprints, but it's just like it, it just goes to show like this is a sprint triathlon and and I mean I, I joke around I don't do a heck of a lot of cardio all the time, but I know I'm not uh, you know I, I'm not I'm not in the worst if I wanted to go for a run or something I, I, I could you know I'm, I'm not in, in, in the worst shape I do stay active but when it comes to this sprint triathlon, all I had to do was ride a bike and I couldn't do it. This guy had third degree burns down his body. 18 months later, after being in the hospital for weeks on end, months, 
And he, and he wins the freaking thing. Like, I'm just, I'm so blown away. And he goes from there and says, you know what, how can I take this up a notch? How can I take this up a notch? And, I mean, we, we love going through these Rise and Shine stories and, you know, and it all kind of comes back. I mean, you saw inspiration in this early on, which is what, you know, got your foundation going in the first place because you pushed yourself. And that's, that's just what, why so many careers, I'd say, come to, not professional careers maybe, but like so many kids that go into sports or, or do whatever, they come to an end because they quit because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But you got to push yourself. And I hate to pump your tires, buddy, but you're, you're an advocate for pushing. Well, we, somebody has to be, you know, and I, I mean, and that's, that's part of the whole reason of, of, of trying to share these types of stories and, you know, and, and, and starting to do more of this type of stuff on this show is, uh, is to share that you know these are normal people that live normal lives that we would all consider normal and 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 doing extraordinary things you know and and uh, that type of thing is a mindset it's uh, uh anybody can do that you really can you just got to pick the right thing because you know that that's what you want to do and you're and you found that passion and then you live by that process that he talks about and you don't just look at you know that super feat you look at what you can control right now one one little piece of the mountain one time one one step at a time until you you're at the top of Everest and you know that's a great metaphor you know he certainly lives by that every day and 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 that's showing not only by his consistency to you know create world dominance performances but also just to uh, you know, to still talk about it and you can cl- see his passion in it and how he, he really feels that he's very genuine in his message. And, mm-hmm. and, and again, that's also important about spreading that message. You know, he's believable. Uh, yeah. I think, and again, those kind of guys are, are people that can really change the mindsets of our youth and, uh, and, and of anybody. And, and, and that's, uh, and, and I, we need more of that right now. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We need tons more stories like that. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, didn't even know call until the phone call and I'm inspired. I'm, I'm ready to rock. And, and I hope people watching feel the exact same way. And, and, and I should, I, I should have asked him this question, but I'd like to ask it to you before we uh, exit the show and get out of here. You went into, I mean, you went over across the pond and again, this is going to be me pumping those tires again, but you went across the pond and you're just thinking to yourself, you know what? I'm just living my dream. I'm playing soccer. This is what I want to do. At what point did you realize how inspiring that could be for somebody else? Uh, I think it's usually when you get your like your first email from somebody that you've never met before that's done the work to try to find it, and then they're like, "Oh, you, you know, this is what I want to do," or you've inspired me to do something, and then because of that, I've I've achieved this goal, and like that kind of thing is 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 the first off. But then um, for me, the like the big aha moment, and this is whole the whole reason behind Rise and Shine is was the documentary film. So right after the World Cup, when when Rise and Shine, uh, the Jada Merritt story documentary, was on Kickstarter. Right, okay. um, they built a whole campaign with raw footage from the World Cup and some interviews that we got from, you know, the coaches and players and stuff from the U.S. national team and, and in England. And then it was like, we'll go to Kickstarter and see if we can raise money to produce this thing. And, and the goal was $215,000 to make it into a documentary film. And in 70 days, uh, you know, in 2011, when Kickstarter was brand new and no one was really donating money over over, right. uh, over the Internet. Yeah. And they raised $223,000 in 70 days to make Jada Merritt into, a, in, you know, into a documentary film. And it was just that that was my empowerment moment to don't to know that like this is way bigger than me. Yeah. You know, this is a moment where, you know, this is an every man story. So, you know, the every man will back it, but we need to support each other as the every man. And, and, and it's those types of things that I think are relatable. Mm-hmm. And uh, that for me was the empowerment moment to share the story and don't be scared to tell your story or to inspire people or to put yourself on the line and stand in front of thousands of people and share your story because it means a lot to a lot of people clearly. You know, I'll never forget, we were at a game one time in the green suits. Somebody came down, and they said, I don't want a photo. I don't want an autograph. I just want you to know I'm a professional. I'm from the island, and you are living the dream of mimes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, we should probably give this a break for a little while. <laughs> dream big. <laughs> so there you go. But um, extremely inspiring stuff throughout. And, uh, and mimes. I, yeah, and mimes. There could be, you know. You know, inspiring mimes out there that were like, I love the green man. They it's were a great fallback, inspiration man. to me. I love if it. This, if this hosting thing doesn't work out, that's, that's my fallback. Back to it. <laughs> huh? That's a rope. Uh, and yeah, there it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you to the Daily Hive, of course, for carrying this. The article comes out. Uh, check that out. You can check us out on YouTube, Facebook. We're on that Twitter thing. We're all over the place. Uh, this is another episode of The Rise, and we will see you in one week.
So we are sitting here at the future site of a really glamorous high-end facility called the Rise and Shine Retreat. Currently we are kind of bootstrapping it with some tents that we've set up to be glamorous campsites, aka glamping. They make perfect accommodation for kids who are joining us for Jay's captain's camps. Well, I think for us, you know, half of this is about the mentorship program. It's not actually about soccer. The sport is, is, is why we're all here. But the mentorship is, is truly about what skills can we present to these kids and really start to give them an idea of what other successful people are doing in this world. And we have fun little competitions, but we always try to walk them out in the, in the mentor's shoes because that's truly how these kids can learn. So we feel it's really important to make sure that they are able to identify their other skills and strengths and particularly passions. It's not just kids coming up and being coached by somebody in their particular sport. It's kids' eyes being open to the multitude of possibilities and potential for success beyond the field. The idea is to create well-rounded individuals through this program. And then the other side of it is, you know, we have all of these athletes who have transitioned out of sport or um, entrepreneurs who have moved on or changed their focus and transitioned out of whatever their career path had been. And it's cool to provide an opportunity for them to be part of it. To see kids grow and to see kids actually participate in these kind of activities is truly for me that the biggest benefit I get out of it all because I could see them physically developing right in front of our eyes. You know, we've been at, at the highest echelons of, of high performance, but we've also, you know, we're normal people, we're relatable people, just like everybody else. And we have this rare ability to, to now create the platform to, to understand what that means, to support each other, to bring back community, in, in, in not only in our kids, but as adults and help each other. I think that, you know, when you achieve success as an athlete and you are so appreciative of all the people who put so much into it, it's only natural that you'd want to sort of turn around and share what you've learned and your experiences with the next generation. We call it the Rise and Shine Retreat. That's what we're trying to create. We want people to come here in the health and wellness space and say, when I leave here, I'm going to be shining brighter. I'm going to understand what Rise and Shine means and the mentality behind it. We want to create a multifaceted facility. We want to be able to host weddings. We want to be able to host kids camps. We want to do fundraisers. We want to host community nights where people come and play sand soccer. You know, we have the license and the, uh, the space to, to really create our, our, our own lifestyle and bring people along with that in, in, in all of this health and wellness sphere that you know, we feel so strongly about and, and have a great crew that can help in those environments and create those atmospheres. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that we want to do here. We, we want to be unique. We want to set a new standard in how we should live and, and, and ultimately create a community that really cares for each other.